G'day everyone. In November 2018, the Queensland branch of the AEVA held the EV Expo at the Brisbane Convention Centre. This uh, displayed a wide range of electric vehicles and had a bunch of presentations from experts in the industry. And this video is just a couple of those experts and what they had to say. If you're interested in coming to the Queensland branch monthly meeting, it's at on the third Wednesday of each month at 7.30 at the Albion Peace Centre. I hope you enjoy the video and I'll see you on the next one. Right, our next speaker um, from Climateworks is uh, Sarah Fume. Um, some people may have seen her speak last year down in Devonport. Um, Sarah's uh, a contributor to the Climateworks initiatives um, in the energy and transport sectors. Um, she's currently leading a, a project to enable the uptake of EVs in local government fleets and has contributed uh, this year to the um, State of Electric Vehicles in Australia report. Uh, so to tell us uh, what's going on about zero emissions for 2050, Sarah Fume. Can you hear me? Yep, okay. Great. All right, so as mentioned, I am Sarah. I am from Climateworks Australia. Um, and I am here today to talk to you about our recent report on the state of electric vehicles in Australia, which we published on behalf of the Electric Vehicle Council. And it's actually the second edition of this report. Uh, we published another one in 2017. So, for those of you who don't know much about Climateworks, we are a research-based not-for-profit based out of Monash Uni, and we were founded by the Maya Foundation and Monash University to translate academic research on climate change into action. So I thought I'd start off with talking to you a bit about why Climateworks is interested in electric vehicles. So Climateworks has done a lot of research on the pathways that Australia can take to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions while still growing our economy. And what we found is that there are four essential pillars for doing this. The first one is energy efficiency, so reducing our energy use as much as we can. The second one is um, low carbon electricity. And it's important to note that the first one actually is really important for the second one. If we reduce our energy use, then it means we don't have to overbuild our renewable generation system. The third one is fuel switching and electrification. So moving from fossil fuel to either renewable fuels or uh, electricity generated from renewable sources. And the fourth one is non-energy emissions. So all of the stuff that we can't cover with pillars one to three, um, requires offsetting with things like carbon forestry. And you can see that electric vehicles are really important for Pillar 3. Um, the transport sector is a substantial proportion of Australia's emissions. I think uh, road transport is about 15%, and it's expected to grow in the future. Um, it's in, under a business-as-usual scenario projected by the Australian government. It's about, I think, growing by about 14% to 2030. So it's a substantial and growing proportion of Australia's emissions and electric vehicles are the most prospective option we have for dealing with that at the moment. So electric vehicles are a proven technology with strong environmental benefits, which we've just talked about the greenhouse gas implications, potential economic benefits in terms of jobs in manufacturing, charging um, and sales, and social benefits in terms of the health benefits through reducing air pollution in our cities. Globally, we are seeing momentum for electric vehicle uptake growing. Uh, between 2016 and 2017, there was a 56% increase in electric vehicle sales globally, and we now have more than 3 million electric vehicles on the road. We're also seeing technological shifts. We've got many new lower cost models to coming to market, and we're seeing continued decreases in um, batteries costs for electric vehicles. Uh, as I think someone mentioned earlier today, we're also seeing governments start to move on electric vehicles. And the reason there's a picture of an Eiffel Tower there is because it's representing the Paris Agreement. So under the Paris Agreement, um, 197 countries have signed up, and they have signed up to limit global warming to less than two degrees, which they have acknowledged requires getting to net zero emissions by some time in the second half of this century. So many countries around the world are starting to think, what does this mean for the transport sector? And they've announced plans to 
at some point in the future, ban the sale of petrol and diesel vehicles. And there are about 11 countries, I think, who've done that. So that's um, China, Germany, France, India, Israel, um, Norway, the Netherlands, and the UK. So quite a lot going on there. And as we've already talked about this morning, lots going on from the global automakers. So for example, Volvo has said that for every vehicle that it, model that it puts out after 2019, there will be an electric and a hybrid um, option available. So what does electric vehicle uptake look like in Australia at the moment? So this chart is showing new electric vehicle sales from 2011 to 2017. And you can see that it's gone from a very low base in 2011 of 49 vehicles to 2,284 in 2017. So that includes 1,076 plug-ins and 1,208 battery electric vehicles. Um, that's a 67% increase from 2016 to 2017. However, it's still only 0.2% of the Australian new car market. So what is stopping uh, more electric vehicle uptake in Australia? And um, pleased to see that these three barriers that we've identified matches what was presented earlier in the day, so exciting that we're getting some consistency. We think that the three barriers that are preventing more uptake of electric vehicles in Australia are cost and model availability, recharging concerns and consumer awareness. And so our report looked at some of um, each of these barriers and so I'll go through that. Model availability. So the International Council on Clean Transportation has looked at electric vehicle uptake around the world and it has found that in markets where there's greater model availability, there tends to also be much higher rates of electric vehicle uptake. So we think it's really important. In Australia in 2017, there were 23 um, electric vehicles available, including the plug-in hybrids and the battery electric vehicles. Um, and I'll go through that a little bit more in the next slide. Okay, so this is the chart we use to talk about model availability. It is a slightly confusing chart, so I will run through it a bit slowly. Um, so the columns represent the number of models available in Australia. Um, the orange is models that are available for less than $60,000. The light grey is vehicles between $60,000 and $100,000, and the dark grey is vehicles that cost more than $100,000. And so you can see that vehicle model availability has increased massively since 2011. However, most of that growth has been in the higher end of the market. Um, in the below $60,000 uh, range, there were only four vehicles available in 2017, and my understanding is that only one of those was available for sale, the rest of them were special arrangements with manufacturers. Um, the lines on the chart show electric vehicle sales. So the top line is total sales, and then the dotted lines underneath it represent electric vehicle sales at different price points. And you can see from the, um, so is this gonna work? Yeah, you can see from this uh, dark <laughs> dotted line that um, the sales of the more expensive electric vehicles is actually what was really driving the total growth in sales last year for Australia. And we found that really interesting when we looked at that because in the previous report, we had looked at this decline between 2015 and 2016 and said, the reason electric vehicle sales are declining in Australia is because there aren't many models available at the lower end of the price range. So I think what this jump in the last year shows is that there is really a market for electric vehicles as luxury vehicles. However, we know that in order to transition Australia's transport sector to something more sustainable, we do need uh, many more vehicles to be available at that lower end of the price range. So we did look at what availability might look like in the future, and I'm sure as EV enthusiasts, some of you out there have probably got more updated information than this, um, but this is what we were looking at in June. Um, and I know a couple of these have already come out, so I think the Audi and the Jaguar, but we did find that there are um, about nine electric vehicles that are expected to come onto the market in the next 18 months, and about five of those are expected to be less than $60,000. So there is some movement happening in the cheaper cost electric vehicle space, um, which should hopefully stimulate some uptake. Uh, the next thing to talk about is recharging concerns. So another barrier we've identified to electric vehicle uptake are people's concerns about recharging. We know that most electric vehicle charging will happen at home or in the workplace. Um, and we know that 
most Australians only drive about 38 kilometres in a day um, and that the average electric vehicle can go much further than that on its battery. So the worry about recharging um, is not necessarily um, based on the data of our day-to-day -day usage. However, we do know that it is still something that people worry about um, and that having pub uh, visible public charging infrastructure can help to deal with that. Um, so, as part of our report, we conducted a survey with the NRMA of about 1,000 residents of New South Wales, the ACT and Victoria, um, and we asked them about their attitudes to electric vehicles. So this question was a little bit leading, so I think um, we asked them if you are going to think about buying a new vehicle, whether brand new or secondhand, what features might discourage you? We also asked the inverse about what features might encourage you, um, but I think this shows um, just how concerned some people are about charging infrastructure. So you can see that cost was pretty high as a concern, um, and then infrastructure was definitely the second option. Uh, so yeah, it is a concern that people have um, and important to address that. So in our report, we used PlugShare to do an estimate of how many electric vehicle charging locations there are in Australia, so not individual plugs, but locations. Um, and we found 783, which is a 64% increase from when we did the report the year before. So it has gone up. And that is about one for every six electric vehicles. Um, you might be asking, is one for every six electric vehicles a sensible number? And the answer is, uh, it kind of depends. So we've looked at um, electric vehicle markets that have strong uptake of electric vehicles around the world, and the um, number of charges really varies. So, for example, in Norway, where there's not a lot of private parking, um, you find that there's about one electric vehicle charger for every five to seven electric vehicles. Whereas in California, where people can pretty reliably charge at home or in the workplace, there's one charger for about every 25 to 30 vehicles. So we might expect that to change over time for Australia as well. Ah, another question we get often asked is, if I charge an EV just from the grid, um, is that more or less emissions intensive than driving an internal combustion engine vehicle? And the answer is obviously, uh, you know, we think it would be great if you could charge your EV using renewable energy and put some solar panels on your roof or buy green power. But if you are directly charging from the grid, um, then we found that in all states except Victoria, um, the average emissions intensity of an electric vehicle is lower than the average emissions intensity of an internal combustion engine vehicle. And there are a bunch of ways to figure that out. So we looked at this by looking at the sales of different electric vehicles in 2016 and comparing that to the um, coming up with a sales weighted average of the emissions intensity of all those vehicles being charged from the grid and comparing that to the internal combustion engine vehicle average emissions intensity for that year. And that's what we came up with. So you can see um, Victoria is a bit higher. Um, so the internal combustion engine vehicle average intensity is 182. Victoria is a fair bit higher than that. Um, however, this number doesn't yet take into account the Hazelwood closure. And as we have Victoria heading towards its target of net zero emissions by 2050, we expect that to improve as well. So in the rest of the states, we see a lower um, emissions intensity of a vehicle, even if it's just charged from the grid. Consumer attitudes. So consumer attitudes are really important to encouraging electric vehicle uptake. To get electric vehicle uptake, um, consumers need to be aware of the potential benefits of electric vehicles. So this is where the survey that we did with NRMA also came in. So we asked um, the people who were participating in the survey um, how they felt about electric vehicles, and we found that about 45.55% said that they would consider buying an electric vehicle if in the market for a car, and then another couple of percent were already researching um, or already had purchased an electric vehicle. We also asked about how cost was influencing people's perceptions of electric vehicles. Um, and you can see, if you add up these two, that is about 35% of people who would be willing to pay more for an electric vehicle than an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, however, most of them, this uh, light grey group, require more incentives or infrastructure or encouragement in place to do that. The dark grey group is people who would be willing to pay 
the same amount um, would, would be willing to buy an electric vehicle if it cost the same amount as an internal combustion engine vehicle. So I think what this shows is that Australians are really interested in purchasing electric vehicle uptake. It's just that the price and the support isn't quite there for them yet. Uh, which leads us neatly into policy support. Um, so as part of our report, we surveyed and did some desktop research on the policies of the state and territory governments and the federal government. And what we found is that there is a bit of a lack of an overarching policy at the federal level. Um, there's no kind of strategy or target for electric vehicle uptake. What we actually think would also be really useful at the federal level is vehicle emission standards. Um, so vehicle emission standards are something that the government has had under consideration for a while. And we think that they're actually a really important policy for encouraging electric vehicle uptake. So vehicle emission standards set an average emissions intensity requirement across all of the vehicles that a manufacturer sells in a year. And then that requirement um, becomes more stringent over time. So because electric vehicles have zero emissions, that's a really big incentive for manufacturers to try to sell more of them um, to achieve that target. Uh, we also looked at financial and non-financial incentives, and you can see that there are a bunch of states and territories who have implemented um, discounts on stamp duty and registration, the most notable being the ACT, um, where if you buy an electric vehicle worth about $60,000, you get about a $2,000 um, discount in terms of registration and stamp duty in comparison to an equivalent internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, and then there's also a lot going on in terms of charging infrastructure, as you've heard from the Queensland government this morning, and it's also stuff happening in Victoria and WA. So, I guess, um, in conclusion, globally, electric vehicle momentum is growing, with 3 million electric vehicles now on the road. In Australia, electric vehicle uptake is growing, but still at only 0.2% of the new vehicle market. And the main barriers are still um, model availability, price and recharging concerns, and consumer awareness. But we're beginning to see some uh, movement in some areas with a number of low-cost electric vehicle models due in Australia in the next 18 months. And policy is really important in helping to stimulate electric vehicle uptake and make the transport sector more sustainable, in particular um, vehicle emission standards. And then just a quick note on the project that we mentioned earlier. Um, so ClimateWorks is currently working with the Electric Vehicle Council and the Municipal Association of Victoria to help encourage electric vehicle uptake in local government fleets. Uh, we think this is an important project because um, across Australia, governments bought 38,000 vehicles last year. There is a lot of purchasing power there. Um, so they can encourage manufacturers to bring new and cheaper models to Australia. And also the turnover in government fleets is quite high. So once those vehicles are um, turned over in a few years time, they will be available on the second hand market, providing another source of lower cost electric vehicles. So we're working with local governments to help provide them with information about total cost of ownership and comparisons with information that we've um, got from talking to manufacturers um, to help build a business case for increasing electric vehicle uptake in their fleets. So if anyone here is from a local government and you would like to get involved, um, please let me know. It's mostly Victorian councils, but we're happy to share information with everyone else as well. And that's it for me. Brilliant. Thanks to Sarah. OK. Right, our next uh, speaker is going to uh, tell us about the EV uptake projections. Um, it's the CSIRO's uh, chief economist of energy, uh, Paul Graham, um, and he's responsible for advice on the global and national economic context for the energy sector. Um, and setting the strategic direction for economic research and leading major projects. Could you please put your hands together for Mr. Paul Graham? Great, thank you. Um, so I just want to take you through how CSRO does its projections and then that'll introduce a few other discussion items. Um, we have a methodology which we've been building up over time um, actually, I didn't 
I didn't do the initial stages of it, but it, essentially we put um, electric vehicles and also things like batteries and rooftop PV in a category of things where um, they, they follow a, like a, a normal consumer technology adoption curve. So they're, and, and what that mean, what I mean by that is there's people who will buy them and it doesn't, and they're not concerned about whether making their money back. So they're our early adopters. And then in the middle, you've got people who are probably a bit more concerned about money. They're the fast followers or late followers. And towards the end, you'll actually get a group of people who, it doesn't matter how cheap it is, they don't want them. So the, the laggards, if you like. And EVs are a classic technology that are currently in the early adopter phase. They're quite expensive, um, but people are purchasing them. And we can see the market growing, and we're kind of thinking about when are we going to get to that faster adopter stage. We're also interested, though, not just in the financials, because that's got a lot to do with the payback period, but also who is buying it and who are they, and the demographics, um, and actually trying to map that across Australia. And some of the early work we've been able to find has said that things like age, household type, in terms of how many people are in the household, educational attainment, um, and their general uh, how much they drive has a lot to do with that. Um, and you can test that against sales rates, so you can sort of check out a suburb, see what demographics it has, and you can predict whether you can predict, uh, you can predict the sales rate in that suburb based on their demographics. Um, other things we think about, um, obviously, and I haven't heard it actually mentioned here, but most people, there's a sort of a broad expectation that electric vehicles more of the short range vehicles will hit cost parity with um, internal combustion vehicles sometime around 2025, maybe a bit later. Um, we do a lot of battery cost forecasts just globally, um, so we know what's going to happen to the cost of batteries. We also know how vehicle the cost of vehicle manufacturing changes with scale. So most electric vehicles are being in ineffic inefficiently manufactured at low scale, like 20,000 a year. You know, a low-cost internal combustion vehicle comes out of a factory that's four or five hundred thousand vehicles a year. So that's the sort of scale we need to move up to. Um, but when you look at efficient scale, EV manufacturing plus reductions in battery costs, I don't think there's any reason why we can't hit parity. I think that's a completely um, rational expectation. We do need to remember, though, that longer-range vehicles will be a bit more expensive and probably always will be. You can't keep adding batteries and not expect the vehicle to cost more. So for every extra 100 kilometres you want, it's kind of like, so it'll be something like 1500 to $2,000 extra. So there'll be a decision there that needs to be made about, do I need a long range or a shorter range vehicle? You, you do have to pay for it. And I think a 700 kilometre range vehicle will probably always cost more than an internal combustion vehicle just because you've got an extra six, $7,000 worth of batteries there. Um, but short range vehicles, Absolutely, cost parity, I reckon. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about charging infrastructure. We know that's building up here in Australia and overseas. Um, so where does that put us? Um, so when we're trying to think through over time and you know, wh where's the top of that adoption curve? How, you know, where does it sit over time? One of the things we try to think through is you know, how are those infrastructure constraints now and in the future acting upon that adoption curve. And we, one of the things we try to think through is obviously uh, for some, there's a short and a long range vehicle purchase decision. Um, with a short range vehicle, okay, you're gonna be worried about range, so we have to take into account range. How worried about range would you be though if you've already got two cars, you've got a second car, if I wanna go for a long range drive, why don't I just use that? So maybe, if, and 60% of households in Australia have two cars or more. So our thinking was, well, how about, I'd say 30% of people don't care about range. So they can grab a short range vehicle and because they've got another car to go a long range trip. So that's sort of one way of thinking through, there's at least 30% car market out there for short range vehicles. So, um, the next thing we might think about is, okay, there's the choice around short range, long range, but maybe there's another choice around how, you know, do I even have a site off, off street where I can charge overnight um, or do I have to rely on public charging? Because if I have to rely on public charging 
it's not there yet. Um, it's building, but that might be a constraint that we have to wait for that charging to come before. Um, so there's a percentage of people, and you can look at household and dwelling types. Am I living in an apartment? What suburb am I living in? Is there much off-street parking? And you can figure out the percentage of people that are not worried about charging um, or having access to charging infrastructure. So this is how we kind of build up some of the sizes of the markets, and that helps to build our adoption curve. Of course, those constraints all disappear in the long run. There'll be business model innovation. There'll be all sorts of things that get around all the issues I just talked about. But the, it's a way of sort of shaping the adoption curve just to start with. So when we apply that, some of that thinking, these are the projections we did for the Australian electricity market operator. Um, they're still probably still relatively in the sort of, um, um, they haven't covered the full uncertainty range, but they're kind of reasonable projections. And um, you'll see that we get to just under 10 million cars in our sort of moderate case in the long run. That's in the context of um, there probably being about 30 million cars in 2050. Um, and I should say that this is passenger cars, commercial, it's trucks, buses, it's the whole lot. And um, so that's about a 30% national fleet share by 2050. Um, one thing to remember though is in order to achieve a 30% fleet share, you must have had uh, something like, a, you must be achieving at least 30% sales for 20 years. So you have to go all the way back to the 2030s when we hit cost parity, remember, and have 30% sales for the full 20 years before you actually hit a 30% fleet share. Um, so it, just because the stock, you know, people don't throw all their cars out immediately, there's, there's a scrappage rate and a, and a turnover of the stock you've got to take into account. Um, and as I said, this was for the electricity market operator, so they're mainly interested in, well, how much power do we need to provide? And that's why they're interested in these projections. Um, at the central case here, it was just over 30 terawatt hours or 30,000 gigawatt hours. That's about 10%. Uh, of current um, power generation nationally. Um, if we think it's going to be a lot higher than that, then, then we'll need more, more power, but it's pretty, 10% is pretty manageable. Um, obviously, there's the other issue about peak demand, uh, which one of our speakers talked about, but just in terms of volume, there's not an issue. The other thing this diagram shows is that there's lots of different projections out there, so, and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, I just wanted to talk to you briefly about sort of more extreme projections and why we might think about um, electric vehicles being a much bigger share of the, um, the fleet. One reason is um, we might be thinking about climate change and decarbonising uh, the transport sector. Um, the thing about electric vehicles is um, they're not only zero emission, let's assume we've decarbonised the electricity sector. Um, but they're also saving you money. Like, if we've reached cost parity, you haven't had to pay more for the vehicle, and then you're also saving money on the fuel as well. So you're actually, it's what we call a negative abatement option. It's a negative cost of abatement, so you actually, you, you save money and you take away emissions. So if you're really going for like a two degrees, one and a half degree world, it would be silly to leave a negative cost abatement opportunity on the shelf and say, we won't go to 100% electric vehicles in Australia. We'll do something more. We'll try to totally transform the cement sector instead, which doesn't actually have any, you know, negative cost abatement options. So I think you, you would get to the point if you're really going for um, uh, a sort of, a, you know, zero emissions, zero net emissions in Australia, I think you would go a lot harder than, than this. Um, you would go, you would try and actually get rid of all internal combustion vehicles. Um, unless some of them are fuel cells, of course, because they can also be zero emission. The second reason you might also get to 100% is because you might, there might just be a tipping point anyway. Um, so one of the issues is once you get into something over 50, 60, 70% EV sales, it flips. It flips to the point where, well, it could flip. I'm only, this is only just thinking out loud, where all the issues with buying an EV now 
become the same issues for internal combustion vehicles. So if you're buying what is essentially a minority vehicle, an internal combustion vehicle, in a world where the majority of sales are EVs, you've got the same sort of problems. Um, is anyone going to be servicing these down the track? Um, all the petrol stations are closing due to lack of demand. Am I going to be able to fuel this up? You know, if I own it for 10 years, will I find towards the end of that that there's no, nowhere to fuel up? Is anyone going to buy my internal combustion engine vehicle? Um, because no one, you know, people are buying EVs, they're not buying internal, internal combustion engine vehicles. So there could be a point where if sales get high enough, we kind of tip over and internal combustion engine vehicles inherit all the problems that EV vehicles have right now and that they're a small share, lack of servicing, lack of, lack of fuel infrastructure. So, so when I say this is our projections, I think there's a lot of up, upside risk that, that, that um, uh, electric vehicles become a much larger share of the fleet than that. But this is, this is our best guess at the moment. I should say we also do a lot of projections for fuel cell vehicles, plug-in hybrids, hybrids and other vehicles, but I'm just concentrating on EVs today. Um, this question about when um, electric vehicles charge uh, is becoming more vexed in terms of, for a number of reasons. We still don't know whether people are going to charge at home or in, in their place of business. Um, we know that night time is off peak at the moment, but we're mostly expecting daytime to become off peak as we get greater penetration of solar in Australia. The other thing is most of us at the moment face no incentive whatsoever to charge at any other time of the day than when it's convenient for us because we've We've all got flat, mostly got flat um, electricity prices. So if I'm trying to provide advice to the national electricity market about should you be worried about peak demand from electric vehicles, I don't know. Um, there's just so many uncertainties. Um, what we ended up doing is we provided all of the above. So we said um, maybe, maybe we'll move charging to the middle of the day Maybe we'll still do convenience charging. Or well, the middle of day is the green one. The blue one is just convenience charging. So you just get home and plug it in. Who cares about who cares about the peak? I'm not paying. I'm not paying a peak price. I've got a flat price. Um, the and then the black one is what if we tried to shift it into into early morning, which is the current off peak. Um, same thing with businesses, but businesses already have a bit of a daytime profile anyway, um, so it wouldn't take much to sort of shift them into the middle of the day. You just move them a little bit away from the evening, afternoon peak. Trucks, some of the profiles we've seen tend to want to charge, charge up at the start of the day. Um, it, it's really, we probably don't have enough data to say exactly what's the most common charging pattern for the heavy vehicles, but Again, I think you could move it to the middle of the day if you had to, or, or earlier in the morning, depending on how you know what scheduling constraints that they have. Um, this is just a map to show you we really did actually run this whole model for um, two and a half thousand postcodes, um, so they each had their own individual adoption model, um, zeroing in on, for example. Whereas this one is a Sydney. Um, so you do get quite differences. And the, and the reason this is important is because obviously each one of those has their own el electricity system constraints. So that's, that's why people have an interest in where, where, where they're charging. Thanks. <laughs>